every day we get in the car and we listen to the radio. So I'm come on and they'll listen to it again. Hey, Dad, are they more famous than you? I'm like, yeah, Michael Jackson is is a lot more famous. Than me. <laughs> they never pick somebody that I'm like, yeah, but like I know him and we're. Fr-. It's always like, you know, Queen. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Freddie Mercury is much. More <laughs> Dad, are you crying? No, no, no. I'm just emotional. That's it. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to this week's edition of the Stay Human Podcast. I'm super excited because we have a Grammy-nominated musician, singer, and songwriter from Nashville, Tennessee. He's toured extensively over the past 15 years alongside artists such as Bonnie Raitt, Taylor Swift, John Mayer, Lady A, Hanson, One Republic, and many more In addition to an impressive catalog of 10, count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 full-length albums, he has written songs for artists like Lady A, Blake Shelton, Ingrid Michaelson, Thomas Rhett, Brothers Osborne, just to name a few. And he currently hosts two podcasts, Dave's Five Hot Takes and Dadville. And he just recently released the audio recordings from his first stand-up live comedy special and his new Christmas EP. So please welcome to the show, Dave Barnes. What's up, Dave? How are you, man? Thanks so much for having me on. When you read that, I just start getting tired. Yeah. (laughs) You're like, God damn, I've done a lot of shit. (laughs) Isn't it funny how you, you... you know, you sum it all up into one paragraph and you're like, whoa, I'm, I'm like getting old. You know, you, you hear all this right, that's stuff. Exactly how, I'm trying to just get to three paragraphs. I think if yeah. people are like, what do you want to retire with? I'm, I just want to make it to three paragraphs. Like, I'm too, <laughs> like let's get another paragraph and I'll feel great. <laughs> it does sound like, um, uh, God, what was that movie uh, with Ben Vereen and uh, um, Showtime? No, all that jazz, it's all that jazz. But he says, yeah. Showtime. And, and oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. it's like Ben Ring goes, Folks, let me tell you about my next guest. He's, you know, yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's that yeah. like they, they give that like Hollywood, you know, like oh, yeah. Las Vegas oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. variety show intro, yeah. man. So, but you yeah. deserve it, man. You've been doing all kinds of stuff with all kinds of people for a long time. And you're, you're what, what I call a slashy. So yes. slashy, you know what that is. It's like oh, music slash oh, yeah. writer yeah. slash yep. producer slash, oh, yeah. you know, podcaster slash yeah, I'm a dabbler. Dad. I'm a tink I'm a tinker and a dabbler. Yeah. Tinker <laughs> and a dabbler. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a tinkler and a dabber. I'm I'm all of those sad people. <laughs> a lot more than I used to, I'll tell you that. So um I want to do a deep dive on your whole life, you know, on just where you came from. But just for folks who've never heard you, never heard your music, never heard what you do, yeah. just give, tell people what it is exactly that you are into. Well, you nailed it. I mean, honestly, it's, it's been one of the things I like the most about what I get to do is that I get to do a lot of really random stuff. Like I have, I have occupational ADD, I have vocational yeah. ADD. And uh, so it's fun because, you know, some days I'm writing songs um, with and for other people, which is so great and really fun. And Nashville, it's interesting, even in this, even in the 20 years I've been here, the, the town has changed a lot because it used to be almost exclusively Christian and country music. Yeah. And then, me and kind of a cadre of my uh, fellow um, vagrants sort of helped, you know, this indie singer songwriter scene kind of keep going. And then now you have all these people from LA come in, all these people from New York and, you know, like I was helping somebody write for this kind of musical thing the other day. So it's just, it's, it's really cool because on any given day as a songwriter, which is part of what I do, you know, you can be writing for anything, you know, from country to Christian to again, musicals to pop to, you know, whatever. So I do that. Um, I've been an artist the entirety of my career. I started doing that uh, when I moved here 20 years ago. And so that's always kind of the main thing that I do is, you know, doing shows and writing and putting out my own albums, which is really where a lot of my, most of my joy and sort of like, I hate to say it, but identity is sort of around is, is that. So that's still kind of yeah. the main thing. Uh, but, you know, man, as I get older, it's just, it, it, it's trickier and I, the road is not quite what it used to be. And I yeah. got three kids now. And so, you know, so so I think to your point, slashing became very uh, a lot more fun because it sort of it sort of underwrites my my life, yeah. you know, and what touring used to. So I still do it and I still play and I enjoy it, but it's just not as much as I used to. And so, and then you know, probably ten years ago, I started dabbling and doing stand up shows. So that's kind of always a little bit. Tell of me a, about that because that's you know usually music and comedy 
you know, comedians and musicians, it's you're either one or the other. You don't get to yeah. be both because it's because it can be really bad. You know, like, like that's exactly like, what I was gonna say. Like you, you sing it's a song really, and you yeah. go, "Was that a joke?" <laughs> that a... <laughs> like that's the worst thing that could ever happen when you yeah. play somebody a song. It's like, dude, that's hysterical, and you're like, "Oh, well, okay, okay." Do duly noted. Yeah. yeah. I, so, so my, my shows and you know people like this, Michael. It's like they were always a lot. You know, it, it was sort of. I grew up seeing a lot of the people that I loved talk a lot in their concerts. It was like a guy yeah. on a guitar, a girl on a guitar. That was kind of the stuff that, especially in college, I was really into. And so I think just osmotically, I sort of thought, okay, well, what you do is like, if it's a dude with a guitar, you know, sure, you can rock through the whole set doing your music and that's cool. But like a lot of the people I like, they had stories and, you know, man, it's like the more you tell a story, the more refined it gets. And you really start to realize like, oh, that's when they laugh. This yeah. is the payoff, you know. Yeah, and so without sure. knowing it, I sort of got this routine together. I mean, you know how it is, man. You're on stage enough, totally. you know exactly how to intro that song and this song and that song. Yeah. And my manager, uh, it's probably about, about a decade ago, my, my manager came and said, hey, man, I think we should try the stand-up thing. Because I, I'd, I'd grown up doing improv and was really comfortable on stage. Doing okay, that kind of stuff. yeah. And, and I don't know if, if you were like this. I was not, you know, music was kind of a... Um, a ran it wasn't a random thing I got into, but I didn't get into it until I was really in college. So I wasn't yeah. one of those guys was rocking the mic in high school. Yeah. Um, I played drums growing up, but but being at the front of the stage is not my thing. And so, but I loved doing it. So it was always this weird, like even as a drummer, like, you know, I'd be the guy on YouTube that's like, you know, like look at how ridiculous this drummer is, and it panned to me, and I'm like staring at you like <laughs> You know, like, yeah. just trying to throw all the were you pointing your stick into the camera? Or were you that guy? Oh, too? Yeah. oh yeah. There was a lot <laughs> nice. of like pointing in the movie. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think for me, there was always a little bit of a pedigree for that stuff, you know, even as a drummer. Yeah. And so when I got, when I started to do shows, because I, I didn't start singing until literally I basically started playing shows, which is a terrible idea in retrospect, mm. like you'd probably be better at it than I was. But the way that I would calm myself down was to talk and to be funny because I knew I yeah. could do that. So what happened is these shows sort of turned into like these really like these weird experiences where people would hear the songs. But I was also like, yink, 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 yink. so, you know, after doing that for five or six years, my manager was finally like, man, let's try to do these stand up shows. And so I just started doing shows basically on the material that I had from my own music shows. Yeah. And then that sort of just and it really went well. Like I had the first two shows I did. I just invited friends, this 50, you know, this little tiny little coffee house here in Nashville and. And me and my friends were like really encouraging. They're like, man, it, it, like, it's funny. It's really funny. You should work on it. Like there's something there. And so I've kind of, you know, moonlit doing it over the last decade where like every couple of years I do five or six shows and then, you know, kind of, cause it, the thing that's hard and, and you know, this, I mean, and I, I've gotten to know more and more stand-up comics, the older I've gotten. And I'm really fascinated by this difference between what we do and what they do. You and I, you're just trying to, you know, eventually in your career, you're trying to build 15 to 17 songs you can play forever yeah right and yeah. ad nauseum, just like and you want to write new songs but man if you can have that sort of nucleus of songs yeah. you're kind of they are the complete opposite it's, they gotta it's change build it up burn, every week build and burn build and burn, yeah. build and burn so you do a tour and by the end of that tour you probably record this the special and then yeah. you nuke all of those jokes forever unless you do encores yeah but that's it so it's the opposite of us like we're just trying to construct this really solid house that can withstand you know yeah. 50 years of weather and yeah. they're kind of like man i just need a like a really solid lean to for a year because <laughs> i'm yeah. in a new climate and it's building up so i think that's the thing that is tricky about it is like i have a really good hour hour and a half but i don't have another 20 new minutes you know what i mean so it's yeah. like people hey you should do some i'm like man i don't i haven't even worked on that right now like I'm <laughs> so yeah you know so so it's fun, but it's it's a very different. Uh, there's you know. there's actually nothing worse than when you go to a comedy show because I I enjoy it and people start shouting out to tell for people to do jokes like do yeah. salty banana, you know right. do, do do car crash do you know like, right 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 you know, right no man that we we've heard that we know we we got the album well, we, we had, heard it you know we had uh <laughs> we had Nate Bargatze on Dadville and he said one of the funniest things because we were talking about his new Netflix special and he was like here's the thing that people don't realize when they're shouting. So when they're shouting jokes, you're shouting the punchline. He's like, you just right. killed the joke by shouting <laughs> yeah. the joke. And I was like, that's such a great observation. So yeah, you're right. It's like that weird thing where when people go, you know, yeah, salty banana. You're like, what? Well, that's where the story ends. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. Like, I can't tell the story. Now. So you're, it's sort of built to fail that way. You know what I mean? 
When you were a kid growing up, what was your house like? Did you have brothers and sisters? Did yeah, you, yeah. You know, we what, had. What, uh, what were your parents up to? So we, uh, my dad is a is was a preacher. He's retired now, and so we had, you know, um, life in the church is sort of like army life in some ways. Which yeah. now that I've said that, like, like, there's a million similarities. But you you tend to move, you know, not a lot. Sometimes people a lot, but for us, we moved about every, on average, probably five to seven years. And so. Um, Born in South Carolina, um, I have two younger siblings, and then we moved to Mississippi, where I spent kind of the bulk of my growing up, about a decade there. And uh, and then, which is a really interesting, it's an interesting way to grow up because we lived in a town of 8,000 people, and it was just as disconnected from the world as you basically can be outside of having like TV. And, you know, it just wasn't, I would go see my cousins in Jackson, Mississippi, which felt like a metropolis at the time. It yeah. was like, look at these tall buildings, you know, like you have MTV, you know, that's, that was sort of that thing. Yeah. And, uh, and it really felt like I'd go and they'd hit me to all this music that I had no clue what it was. You know, I'd buy those CDs and go home and just like, uh, but the great thing about it is you really got to, it just felt like this really safe, just off the beaten path childhood. Like the, I, there was nothing to really worry about. There was no crime. It was just like this wonderful chill. Um, you know, you're on, it, it really felt like every movie they made in the eighties. That's what yeah. my childhood was like, okay. on your bike, on your BMX, you yeah. know, riding 50 miles a day. E. All over the world. Yes. That's exactly what it felt okay. like. And so it was a real gift because I think we got to really just be kids, which man in retrospect. And did you have just, brothers and sisters? Yeah, too. I had a little sister that's two years younger than me and then uh, have, um, and then another little brother who's six years younger. And so, um, and we were really close. Mom and dad were great. We moved to Knoxville when I was in high school. Dad planted a church there. And then um, from there, I was there for two years. And then I went to MTSU and studied music at Middle Tennessee State which was great and was, you know, kind of a suitcase school. So it was, a, it was an interesting college experience because I had dear friends. Some of them are still my closest friends that I met there, but like, you know, 20,000 people went there, but this weekends, it was just a ghost town because it was yeah. a commuter school. Yeah. And so it just, it was really fun because we kind of had lay of the land. It was just kind of like, you know, it went from feeling like this bustling, crazy week to like, nobody was there. I mean, it was yeah. like, and so you kind of had a run of the place and Murfreesboro was a great little, it's a, it's a really fun little college town. So, but that's really where I got into music. And I think. So on you know, the I weekends, it, it was this like, you know, you could turn your dorm room into like garage oh, yeah. central was, and yeah, turn your amplifiers dead. up. And yeah. Yeah. yeah nobody. Just go wild yeah. and crazy. Yeah. It's great. I want to just pick up like when you're a kid growing up um, and, and you, well, first of all, what did your mom do? She was a teacher. So when we were little, she she didn't work you know she was doing the mom thing and then uh right about the time we were all kind of like i mean my little brother would have probably been like sixth or seventh grade she started to teach again yeah math teacher my father was a math teacher oh yeah man and i'm uh, math is my worst subject and i have oh. four siblings and they were all great at math except for me <laughs> and the thing was we'd go, i'd go to school and the teacher would say no, you, okay, you're going to put it here and you put the other number below it and then you subtract it and then you take the 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 subtract the divide it and you d multiply it and then you get this thing and you put an x on it and then and then and then I'd go home and I'd try to show that to my dad and my dad would go that's all wrong. You don't you shouldn't do it that way and so I'd get like it's like I had two different math teachers at the same Oh time. my god. Teaching me two different methods of, of doing the same problem, you know? And, and it was, it was just horrible. And my dad that makes for some really confusing. Oh God, it was brutal. Yeah. I never, yeah. and to this day, like the other, um, a couple months ago, um, the, my, the school that I w went to college at, which I never finished, invited me to come, come. And they were like, we want to give you an honorary degree. And my wife was there at this thing. She was like, oh, hell no, you're not giving him no honorary degree. Like, and I was like, honey, you don't understand. There's one class that's keeping me from this. It's math. Like I will never do a math class ever. Like I'm, I will fail. It's like, I won't even, and you know, all the other classes, I'm sure I could power my way through, but math, right, I, right, right. I won't even make it, you know, no, I won't even show up. My and so I was no trying doubt. to convince her. She was like, no, 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 no honorary degree for you. <laughs> so I know what it's like to be the child of a math teacher. <laughs> Yes. And have zero That's math like a really skills. great book, by the way. Yeah. Sounds like an Oprah pick the child of a math teacher. Yeah. Do child of a math teacher. <laughs> Tell us that joke again. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the other question I, I, that, that came to mind was when you're a kid growing up and you're watching 
your father preach. Yeah. Like how has that affected you as a performer? Like, what did you learn? What did you think? Like, I oh, God, I never want to be that guy. You know, like what were the pluses? That, that is a really informed question. That's a very, that's a very oh, good question. I, you know, I'll see videos of myself on stage and it's like, holy cow, some of the mannerisms and like, cause, cause dad, I'm, up, I'm so thankful. My parents are really wonderful people. And that's such a gift because it's not always the case with people that do ministry, but my parents are really great and really live what they believe, which is a huge deal. But, but dad was always like, he always, if you could see that he always had a joke, like it'd be like, if this sermon is just not connecting, he'd have like a little, and get him back the in. Zinger. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think just watching him, I think too, you know, I, I don't know. I, this is something that fascinates me as much as anything does. I think there's this crazy osmotic thing as a kid that you're taking in all of this information that you have no clue you're taking in, especially mm. with your parents. And I think about with my kids, you know, when they see me play, I always think about this. I'm like, I just wonder what their brain is doing that they don't know they're doing. Like, and I think there's something when you have a parent that's on stage, that stage is suddenly not, it's a, it's a place that's known. It's not, yeah. I mean, I'd say my kids don't get nervous. My, one of my, my sons is about to do this thing where he's singing a couple songs in this play and he's terrified. He's 10 years old. But I also think there's a part of him that's like, this is, this is not a, this is a known entity. My dad yeah. does this. He stands all these things and he does it. Yeah. And so I think for me, even in, at an osmotic level, at a subliminal level, I think me seeing my dad be in front of people all the time sort of gave me this like, oh, that's like a thing. Like, that's yeah. not, you know, when yeah. I asked me to speak, I'm not like, <gasps> I was like, okay, yeah. I'm nervous. But like, okay, this is kind of, this is sort of family business. This sort of, you know, so I think yeah. there is something, that's a great question. I think there is something to seeing that that sort of gave me this space. It was like, man, I kind of, I feel more comfortable up here than I thought I would because it's yeah. not this like unknown, you know, frontier. You know what I mean? Yeah. Did you ever think you might be a preacher? Is there ever a point in your oh, life? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, before music got into it, I think that was, Never from my parents, Lord knows. I mean, that was not something they were ever like, this is what you should do. But I just think for me, I was kind of like, I just didn't have, before I really got passionate about music, I had no, there was nothing that I was like, like I wasn't the kid growing up hooping, like, oh, you know, I, I'd skateboard and stuff, but it was, nothing was ever like, I live to do this thing. Yeah. So when music came in and, and became what it became, it was like, you know, it was a big deal. But before that, it was like, yeah, I'll probably just go to like seminary and be like a youth pastor or something. And, mm. you know, just professionally order pizza and watch movies with kids, you know? No, it's not, man. It's not good on your gut. But yeah, I think before then that was probably, that was probably kind of, and again, man, I, you know, I think it's that osmotic thing. I think as a kid, when you see your parent do something or parents, I think it's hard not to just think that's probably what you're going to do. I mean, that, that, yeah. I mean, as you know, it's like, that was our world for hundreds of years, you know, really. Before, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, technology up and, and the, the trade gets passed down. Oh yeah. yeah. It just gets passed down. So yeah. I think, you know, there is something deep, deep, deep in all of us. I really do believe that sort of like when you see your parents doing something, the first thing you think is probably, I'll probably just do that, whatever that is. So that was definitely um, where I was until music, you know, came in and, and <laughs> rocked my world, little country girl. You know, well, what was your were your parents receptive to the fact that you were wanting to do music? Tell tell me the etymology yeah. a little bit of that of how it Look came to be. The etymology, okay, yeah. respect. You know, mom and dad were. Um, it's kind of their fault, honestly, because because my dad especially like loves music, like he loves music, and so I think when I really started to get into it, like I played drums my whole childhood, and so it was kind of always around. But I, th I, I will say, I think when I really felt like, man, I think I wanted to, because I got to college, I was playing drums. They didn't really have like a great drum program. They had like a great classical percussion program, which is a mm. wild different thing. Yeah. And has nothing to do with the drum kit. I've, always, uh, I've I, often wanted to be the guy who plays the cymbal in the oh, symphony brother. because you're just not even that part of it. Just, just like you're waiting, you're reading no. the sheet music, you're reading There's the sheet nothing. music. 20 minutes passes, you're waiting to shoot music, and then you do the little, the little, yeah, yeah, yeah. the little <laughs> yeah. tremble, you know, and then you're reading yep. sheet music, reading sheet yep. music, everybody yep. else is yep. playing, and then finally you come to the part of the song, you just get to crash the shit up, just, oh yeah, just go, <laughs> yeah. And just make the loudest that. noise in the whole thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I always wanted to be that guy, and I thought, man, how hard could it be to really 
be that. Like there's one note on the page and it's just there's somebody crash, looking at this you, know? like, you have no idea how hard that is. Yeah. You know, I spent my whole life waiting. Um, and, then, and then you miss it and then you're really, oh, yeah. you really, know, you're done. Yeah. They bring in career two, over. Two. Yeah. Yeah. Symbolist. Yeah. I, I think once I got serious about it, like once I'd, I'd start playing guitar, um, right before I got to college, my roommate had a guitar at college and I don't know about you. I mean, I know you, you came up through the hip hop world, but like for me, once I got an instrument that I could write on, that was what I did. There was no, I, I, I didn't want to learn like blue scales. It was all about this thing was a utilitarian device to get me to writing songs. I'd never written songs. There was no pedigree for that, but something in my makeup was like, I think that's what I want to do with this. And so I'd never sung, but something in me was like, man, I just want to write songs. So once I started doing that and started to do like little, like I, my best friend sang the songs I would write. And then eventually he was kind of like, man, I think you should sing some of these songs, right? And they're pretty cool. Once I started getting on stage doing that, it was like, oh, okay. Now yeah. this is what I love, you know? Wow. And I think that, you know, my parents at that point, my mom really, my dad was kind of always like, you know, I think he was cool with it. My mom was a little more like, I remember one time, we t- she tells the story all the time and, and is so embarrassed by it. But, you know, I remember one time I went home kind of toward the end of college and, um, and I was really starting to feel like, I think I want to do this like music thing. Yeah. And mom was like, I'll never forget. Cause she's mom's greatest, but she came out of the car and she's like, Hey, I was about to drive off. She's like, listen, I'm just nervous about this. She's like, you know, you've never done this. We've never done it. Like you sure music is what you want to do. And I was like, you know, mom, you've always taught me like trust in the Lord and he'll give you desires of your heart. And she said, she was just like, well, <laughs> okay, go have fun. It's like, it's that weird moment where you're like, wow, I see you've learned young Padawan, you know, like, <laughs> uh, and for her, she was like, it really was a moment of humbling of going like, yeah, this is the stuff I taught you. Now I have to live it as yeah. your parent. I can't just tell you this information and then just trust that like, uh, yeah. you know, it'll, it'll, you know, that I don't have to do it too. So, so I think, you know, after that, I think she was kind of like, look, it's what he's going to do. And let's, let's support him. And, and ever since they've been, you know, hugely supportive. My mom was but, the same way growing up. She was always like, you kids, you got to be yourself. March to the yeah. beat of your own drummer. Until I told him I wanted to be in a band with drummers, you know? And then it was like, don't come to me with those Jedi mind tricks, trying to turn my words back on me. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, she never really like said it outright, like don't do it. But she, she never, it was a long time into my career before she kindly gave me my stamp of, you know, too, okay. I don't know if you feel this way with age and wisdom, but like, you know, and, and having kids and whatever, but I, I get it a lot more now. Like, I think at the yeah. time I was like, but you know, when you have a kid that comes to you and says, I want to do this guy. And, and you know, as well as I did, Michael, like, Music these days is a weird industry, man. It's nothing very, like it was 20 years ago. Very challenging, you know, yeah. Monetarily. Yeah. But I think about this with my father-in-law too, man. Like when I sat down with him, I was like, look, I love your daughter. I want to marry her. You know, he, he, we had a great conversation. He's a wonderful man. Um, but, you know, he wasn't like, you really think this music thing's going to work? He never did that. He was like, yeah. you know, God will take care of y'all. I trust it's going to be okay. But I just, I now at, at 43, I'm like, if my daughter and 10, 15 years came to me and, you know, here's this boy I love and he wants to do music. I'm going to be, and granted, you know, I'm privy to a lot more things than because I do it yeah, or whatever he wanted. I want to be a filmmaker or something that's in that world, the arts. Yeah. I think it, part of me is going to be like, bro, like this is my daughter, man. You know, like, yeah. are you going to be able to do it? You know? And so I think now I, I have a lot more empathy for, for my mom's plight. And I think anyone who was ever sort of like, you sure about this, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> How's this going to work? <laughs> you know, the greatest gift that my dad gave me, and my dad was not always fully present. He was alcoholic and not really super together for a lot of my life. But later in his life, he, in fact, when he was 66 years old, he had a stroke. And he suddenly blossomed from this person who had like two emotions like anger and silence and there really wasn't much in between except maybe a little cynicism and sarcasm but when he became 66 he had a stroke and and it was like being sick made him well he blossomed from this really dark person into this really super loving person and it was like he'd been in a cocoon his entire life and suddenly became a butterfly and I, I had lunch with him one time 
when it was just me because with five kids you don't get to do that very much have like one-on-one so after his stroke had happened I, and he changed and I went and had lunch with him and he said you know I'm really happy that you went and followed your heart and did music and I was shocked because mm-hmm. he was really not super into it you know and and he said to me if I had it to do all over again I would have become an architect but I always told myself that, you know, not everybody's going to want to build my building. But if I learn math, then I could be the math teacher who teaches the architects. And then I'll always have a job at least. Mm-hmm. But he felt like he settled for less than he wanted to really be in his life. Mm-hmm. And he was unhappy because of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in saying that he was he was just giving my blessing like go out into the world do what you love do what you desire you know follow your heart and um was there ever you know something in in your life that was may, maybe not exactly like that because you sound like you had supportive parents but was there, was there ever something in your life that you failed at and mm. found a gift in like, wow, thank God that didn't work out because I'd be trapped doing that dumb thing or whatever, you know? Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I still, you know, I think in a lot of ways, I'm still failing at a lot of things, learning new things, you know, like I think, um, I'm I'm in that club too, bro. It's funny, isn't it? It's like you, you would think it as you get older, like you, you do get better at things, but I think also, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think I, I, I was kind of a weird kid. Like I was sort of Teflon Don with a lot of things because I was just so unbelievably optimistic. Like I was sort of the little engine that could. Um, okay. And I don't think I had a lot at stake. I think one of the beautiful things about mm. music being something I didn't grow up doing is I wasn't a kid that was like, this is who I am. Yeah. And if I don't sort of stick the landing on this, I've, 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 I've failed. Yeah. I was like, man, this is found money, man. This is like... I yeah. can't believe I'm getting to do this. So I think for me, failure was, was, it was, <laughs> this is a weird way to say it, but I think I, I just started at such a low place. I was already like, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. You know, yeah. I had everybody I knew was better at me than what I did. Everybody. So for me, I started there. It was like, yeah. so any, it was <laughs> only progress. There was only up, you know? So I think for me, it didn't really get risky for me until probably 20 years in, you know, because I think, mm success for me happened, you know, a good ways into my career. And that's when it got real tricky. That's when failure got really scary because at the beginning I didn't have anything to lose. So failure was like, yeah, I'm going to fail. I don't know what I'm yeah. doing. I've never sung before. I've never sung in front of 20 people, much less 200. So yeah, I'm going to have some nights around sound. Well, we move, you know, who cares? But you know, once you get known for something, once it's like people, once the eye of pressure songs, light comes on, yeah. on you and, and it's like, okay, Michael, like you're good at this show us what you can do. It's sort of like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. but it's sort of like, we're here to see you do your thing because we yeah. think it's great. That's a very different feeling than being the kid who's trying to get, just get some eyes on him. You know what I mean? That's out there just scrapping, you know, that that's the fun part for me. Cause it's like, nobody knows about you anyway. You can't really yeah. fail. So I think for me, um, it's like the last five to 10 years of my life have been a lot harder with that stuff. Cause it's like, once you sort of, you know, people know you for something and you do have stuff that works. You know, that's the thing, man, about success. I just think it's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a unbelievably affirming. I mean, you, you know, this for your career, the success mm-hmm. you've had, like, it feels great. Like, you're like, I can't believe something I thought would work is work. But man, there is a scorpion tail on that thing that is so gnarly with what it does to your head if you're not careful. And I think especially around the, the, what does this mean moving forward? And like now, if the next thing I do doesn't work, have I failed? And does that discredit the success that I had? And You know, all that stuff that I always thought, like I heard about imposter syndrome. I was like, what does that even mean? Like in my twenties, I just, I was like, roll my eyes at that. You know, now in my forties, I'm like, bro, that's a very freaking real thing. Like, yeah. and, and so I think now, you know, to your question, I deal with it a lot more day to day now than I ever have of just kind of like having to be really disciplined around how I think about things or, and you know, man, songwriting, that part of my career is a really weird part of my career because when I write songs for other people, I have no say in how that, what happens that song. I mean, yeah. you know, this yourself and 
your career, like you write a song for yourself, you don't like it, you just write the next song. And then oh, yeah. I like that. And, but you know, when you're writing for other people, you're just sort of like giving this thing away and then they walk off with it and you're like, I don't know if I'll ever see that again. So yeah. that, you know, if you're not careful, I think that can feel a lot like failure because you're like, I love that song. They didn't like that song. And then, yeah. and you just have no control over it. So it's a very precarious um, living. It's wonderful living, getting to create like that, but there's just so little control. So it's hard to not, every time that happens, log it as failing, you know, like failed, 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 failed. Oh, yeah. that worked. Okay, good. Now fail, 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 fail. What was yeah. the first song that you had that became successful? Came a hit. Yeah. So I had done, I, you know, I'd put out, um, gosh, four records at this time was, and you know, man, this was back when, I mean, you've been doing this longer than I have, so you've been seen better than I do, but man, that was nothing like showing up to shows and having a bunch of CDs and just selling, you know, like you could leave your yeah. merch table did really well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you could have a bad show, like, or, you know, like not get paid well from the door, but still like make some money. Cause you had merch, you know what yeah. I mean? It was like, yeah. you could, you could do that. So I did that for a while and, and by the grace of God was able to, you know, have a great career as an unsigned acoustic kind of thing, blue eyed soul thing or whatever. And then um got signed to a label out of New York and did a couple of records with them. And then and on one of those records was a song I'd written called Guy Gave Me You. And then I put that out first, which was really fun. And it did really well, which was which was a whole other story. And then um Blake Shelton, you know, who's on the voice. Yeah. He, um, he heard it and loved it. And so then he recorded it and it was like this big old hit for him, which was great. And then that kind of like got me into writing more for other people. Cause I, I'd done that, like friends would come through town and hit me up, you know, yeah. okay, dude, what are you doing today? Nothing. I'm gonna come by and let's write something. So it was that, it was that sort of very, uh, uh, you know, organic. We're just having lunch and somebody goes, I have this little guitar lick. And as you're eating your burrito, you're like, Oh, have you thought about doing that? And I'm like, no. And yeah, what, what's the title you got? Okay. And, you know, it's just like, cool. And then you fist bump and they go play their show. It was not yeah. like real building, you know, we're going to sit, but, you know, write a song like 10 pan alley kind of vibes. Like you have a title, I have a title. It's in the key of C, you know? Yeah. And so um, I just didn't know that world. And so when that song did what it did, all of a sudden everybody was like, Hey man, does this mean you're like writing songs for other people now? And, you know, I was so tired from touring. I was like, yeah, sure. And so then that's when sort of the professional songwriting thing came in where I, you know, I did my first like co-pub deal and and mm. would spend like half the week doing that, you know? Um, and since then I've had more hits, which has been fun, but, uh, but it's just such a different thing, you know? I mean, you know that it, it's yeah. kind of that difference between like organic people sitting around, just writing some songs, having fun and, oh, and then no, they went and cut it. That's awesome to like, okay you know, show up at 10, you got an idea. Cool. What are you thinking? This is the vibe. Okay. You know, you have a great day, but it's like pro you're like a pro. Yeah. You know? It's like a bunch of pro songwriters. Yeah. You know? It's four fifty nine. Let's wrap this yeah. song up. <laughs> Do we have yeah, a second yeah. verse yet? No, well, we better get one quick. Cause we're out of here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, you know, it's, it's, it's uh it's really fun but it all kind of came from that you know once you do that people tend to be like hey you got more of those <laughs> yeah, i mean you know that yeah, right? I doubt. <laughs> like you could just pull them out of any orifice oh, I know. Any yeah time. i've got as many as you want yeah, yeah. <laughs> um how is how has being a parent affected your your art and or your career i mean you kind of described it you know how when you get to a point with you have kids and you know it becomes more challenging to be on the road all the time and to balance that, that work life, um, thing. And, but, but more than that, how has it affected you as an artist and what you do and what you write about and what you talk about? You know, it's crazy. I, this is embarrassing enough to, to say this out loud because it took me whatever, 10 years to realize this is apparent, but I was talking to a friend of mine about this the other day. Like I haven't ever really sat down and thought about this, but my music and your music and it's going to be around kind of forever. Right. Mm. And I never thought about how weird that's going to be someday when I'm gone, that my kids can still access that, that they can mm -hmm. still hear my voice, hear what I'm singing about, hear the music, all of it. You know, you've got yeah. a ton of records. I've got a bunch of records. It's like, I just hadn't thought about it and it really rocked me. I was like, man, mm -hmm. what a weird sort of like time machine for my kids and their grandkids and their kids and their kids and their, you know, like yeah. that they can always go back and go like, this is great granddad's music. This is dad's music. This is even when I'm not here. Mm -hmm. And so I think now I think so much about like the legacy of it, you know, like, you know, really going like, what am I saying? And what do I want to say? And, and um, it's kind of this message in a bottle to, 
the generations down the road a little bit, you know? And so I think it's a little more sobering because it's, I mean, and, and it's not like I need to make it anything that it doesn't need to be, but I do think it's, I just hadn't thought about that. And it really messed with me in a really wonderful way, like a really sobering, beautiful way of like, gosh, you know, like there's going to be some day when I'm not here my kids, whatever age they are, um, you know, can like, if they're missing me, like pull up a song and a drive home, like yeah. <laughs> it kills me, you know? Yeah. So I do think there's, that's a beautiful part of it. I think, um, but you know, man, you know, it's like, I think kids are this wonderful thing that just give a lot of context to a lot of other things. I mean, you have to be careful yeah. with that because it can't just be about your kids, but I think it helps me a lot in realizing what matters. You know, I think if I'm not careful, my career is sort of paramount and it's, got a bunch of my identity and I'm like, okay, I'm only as good as my songs are or how people like them. And then you walk inside and your kids are, you know, hitching the nuts and you're like, no. Oh, and you're like, okay, back to reality. <laughs> back to life. Yeah. So, um, so it is a real, I, it's really sobering. It's really beautiful. I, I get so much joy. I get uh, unbelievable amounts of joy knowing that my kids are around the music scene and they're around music and they're around creativity. And mm. so I really love that. That is, I think one of the greatest gifts I'm giving my kids is that they get to see, uh, they get to be around creative people and it's viable. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a real career that is tangible. It's, it's not magic. It's not like fairy dust. Like they come back to my studio in the backyard while I'm working and Hey, what's up? What do you play that for me? And I'll play it on play. That's cool, dad. You know, like, I just think that's like the coolest thing. So they just give so much fun and context to something that can feel really nebulous and sort of, you know, uh, it's fun to kind of see them lean into it. And, you know, they still, it's my favorite thing. Like if I, they know I'm working on something, they'll just, dad, play what you're working on, you know, but, but, hey, put it on the car. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. You know, and they'll, yeah. and you see them, they really listen. Like they're like, you know, they're looking out the window and they're like, we want it, dad. Okay. That's cool. I like that. You know? And I'm like, God, what a cool thing. Nice. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, they're the toughest critics right there, you know? They are, man. They're, you know, I've been, like on this Beatles, I've been on this Beatles deep dive. And, and one of the, I mean, the, this could last five hours, but one of the things that I think is really remarkable about them is playing that music for kids. Yeah. Because those kids, like, it just sticks, man. It's like, you can, well, we've been basically going through their catalog, driving to school every morning. And it gives me so much joy that, like, I'll pick, you know, I'll pick her, my wife will pick the kids up and they'll get home and they'll be humming whatever song that we, and I'm like, that's, there's a million things about the Beatles that are genius, but man, if you really want to distill it to me, it is that a five-year-old can listen to, you know, paperback writer and later that day we'll be singing that song. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what's, that's what's remarkable about that stuff. You know, isn't it great? I have one son who he grew up right as, you know, the internet was sort of starting to pop off. And then I have another son who grew up during, you know, pretty much his whole life internet. And then I've got another son and who's now, th who's three, who's full blown, you know, he's grown up yeah. with mom and dad yeah. on Instagram, you know, but my middle child is such an incredible musicologist because mm -hmm. music for him has never been time dated. It was never like, oh, there's a new song out by Ed Sheeran, or there's a new song out by Alessia Cara, or there's a new song by, you know, Octavia. Or it's, it's never been like that. It was always like, hmm, I'm just flipping through something, and here's the Smiths, How Soon Is Now. And then I'm flipping right. through something else, and here's Cannonball Adderley from mm -hmm. 1968. And then I'm yeah. flipping through something else, and here's like Iron Maiden from, you know, 1976. And it, but it, it, there's no date on any of it. It's just yeah. as it's coming through his whatever feed that he's flipping through, it all feels like it's brand new to him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's such a cool way because my son is uh, is so all over the place musically. And, yeah. and it all feels fresh, you know, in his experience. Yep. That's yep. such a cool thing. It is, man. It's a real, it's fun. It's like, I've realized that for me, I know, I know the Beatles and I know when they created my kids don't have a clue. Yeah. So they could be like, Oh man, lady Madonna, when did this come out yesterday? And I'm like, no, 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 yeah. no, no, a long time. And they're like, Oh, well, it's really cool. Like there's yeah. no, con you know, they're just like, it's good. That's cool. Yeah. You know, it's, and so it's fun to see them 
yeah, you nailed it. Just kind of take music in as it comes. I, I, I do, th- I think it's, a, um, I, I, this is a whole other conversation, but I am really fascinated with what that's going to do to, because I think that's something that is sort of important. That's where I sort of put on my <laughs> old dad hat. Where I'm like, yeah. well, kids, don't you forget, you know, it's sort of like your dad when you came home with the math and he's like, no, let me tell you about real math. That, <laughs> yeah. That's sort of how I feel sometimes. Cause I'm like, I do think to understand music, the, the, the uh, chronology of it really matters. You know, I think that's why the Beatles mm. matter so much is what they gave birth to mm. is pretty substantial. And so that's some of why I want them to listen to it is to understand that, you know, so much of what we have now is only because of what they sort of laid the path for in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know? Otherwise and they're going to grow up thinking, man, those Beatles guys, they stole all my dad's songs. <laughs> Can I tell you, this is one of my favorite things about being a musician. Maybe you shouldn't that. tell them. <laughs> oh, my, my kids, they do this so much, and it is comical. Every day we get in the car and we listen to the radio. Song, come on, and they'll listen to it again. Hey, Dad, oh, yeah. um, are they more famous than you? I'm like, yeah, bro. They're, uh, they're def- and Michael Jackson is is a lot more famous than me. And, they're like, <laughs> and, and they just log it back, and your next song comes on. Dad. Um, is this guy more famous than you? I'm like, yeah, yeah. The Beatles, um, they're pretty well known. <laughs> a lot of, okay, cool, cool, cool. I mean, they, it's like for some, they're trying to understand where I live, like what, yeah. ha- you know, and so, and it's always like, they never pick somebody that I'm like, you know, yeah, but like, I know him and we're, fr- it's always like, you know, queen. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Freddie Mercury is much more <laughs> <laughs> like, is this like a dig are they just subtly digging me and i don't know they are where it's like yeah. you know, they're laughing in the back seat hey dad um you know uh it's the worst when they when they when they hit like the 16 year old area they're gonna they're gonna they're, they're gonna pull that out as their game you know like let's oh see if we gosh. can trick dad with this one again oh my god dad are you crying no 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 i'm just emotional that's it i'm just yeah. happy. <laughs> You're happy dude Hey, I got one final question for you, um, which is the one I ask everybody on the show, which is how do you define being human? What does it mean for you to be human? And how do you stay that way? How do you hold on to your humanity in this crazy world that we live in? Man, what a great question. You know, I think for me, it's about being present, like whatever Mm -hmm. that means. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I do not want to do that. Like if, if my North Star is moving i want to go like let's go to the next thing yeah. what's the next so for me i think it's about speed of life it's about like if you're sad like be sad you know if you're um lonely like be lonely if you're uh happy man be happy you know but i just think it's about being being present it's about like being a human where you are at that exact mm-hmm. moment and i think that's really hard for me and I think as I get older, that's something like just practicing presence, just like really trying to not move through the human experiences that are really hard, but really going like, man, this is just part of being a human. Like having somebody hurt your feelings is, hey, it's just the way it goes. Having your kids um, not listen to you, you know, having your car pop a freaking tire, but just going, hey, this is like, here I am. You know, like, I think that for me is, is, is something that, um, it feels very human. It feels like kind of honoring this, this plight we're all on as opposed to sort of just fast forward into the best, the greatest hits. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we said all the songs, <laughs> like, you know, like living through those two. Um, but I think that's probably how I do it. Well, that's awesome, man. I, I, I really resonate with that because, you know, as a dad, especially, um, you know, I remember moments where I'd be like swinging my kid in the park and 20 minutes would go by and I'm just like, oh, here I am, like swinging my kid. Like, where did this 20 minutes go when I was, could, could have been focusing on what was happening right in front of me, but my mind was just so, in so many other distracted places. And it's been, a, you know, it's just like you described, it's been a journey throughout my adult life of really working on focusing in that way and working on being present in this, and especially for the people that I love the most, you know, mm. that's the greatest gift is to be yeah. able to be there as that kind of listener and participant in the conversation and, 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 and intuitive their emotions and being able to hold space for them. So that's uh, one of the things, you know, I'll tell you that one of the things that, um, 
still in Dadville, you know, we talked to these dads. And one of the things that a guy said to me once, I think about maybe as much as I think about anybody, anything anybody said is he just said, you know, every now and then this is a guest on the show. He said, every now and then when I get around families that like the kids are grown and they still all like hang out. So I'm like, well, you, everybody still kicks it. Like this isn't like the kids get out and like, they never want to come back, see it. Like they actually enjoy being together. Like their grown dad loves being with the grown son and vice versa. He said, I always ask him like, what kind of mate, like he asked, he said, I asked the parents, he's like, what did you do to sort of create this culture in your family? And, and he said, it is almost always in every scenario that he's been in, it's almost the same answer. And it's just to stay interested. And I think to your point, Michael, like you got to be present to be interested. Like you got to be in the moment that when your kid comes in and goes, dad, check this out. Yeah. And you go and you sit and he shows you the marble game he just did. And, and you're not. And for me, I'm not going, God, do I like that chorus? That should we should change keys to A. Eh. But I'm going like, look, the ball goes here and he goes, dude, do it again. Let me see it. And, and I think to your point, it is such a gift, especially as you said, I can't say that enough to the people that we care about because to stay interested, you got to stay present, you know? And I think it's, I think about that all the time. Like what a gift that is to, especially my kids and my wife um, and friends, but like to them, especially that when they go, Hey, check this out. That I'm like, all right, I'm here. Like I'm eyes on, I'm with you. Like this matters to me too. You know, and I think your kids growing up feeling like, that, that they matter to you in those yeah. small little moments, I think are what really actually builds out the whole thing. You know, yeah. uh, it's not really the moments we wish where they sink the basket and you're over there giving them the thumbs up. I mean, sure, it's a part of it, but I think it's these really yeah. micro moments that they're like, he just kind of always seemed to be tuned in. You know, yeah, my, my friend Joey had a great way of summing that up. He said, if there's four magic words that you can use that will help you in any relationship in your life. I was like, what? And he said, tell me about it. Dude. I mean, tell isn't me about that it. me? It's like, like, just like what you said, your kid comes home from school and Hey, I did this thing. And you say, tell me about it. Yeah. And isn't that listen. great? Yeah. Yeah. And even I'm 43. And when somebody says, tell me about it, I'm like, Oh my God, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. I will. I will. <laughs> Yeah, it's the greatest respect you could ever show anybody. In the greatest, it is. That's, that's yeah, beautiful. Just to I listen to him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's great. Well, Dave, it's been awesome listening to yeah, you, and sharing this time yeah. with you. And uh, can folks see you this year? You're going to be hitting the road at all this this touring we're doing, season? Uh, we're doing some kind of different touring. We hadn't announced yet, but yeah, I'll be I'll be out doing some. I always do Christmas shows. I do Christmas shows every year. So definitely doing that. But uh, yeah, we we're we're. Uh, we're developing this thing. We're about to announce what we're going to be doing. So um, awesome. We'll out. keep yeah. our ears peeled and yeah. our eyes on Instagram. <laughs> I'm going to be looking at Instagram 10 hours a day <laughs> to find out what you're up to next. Oh my gosh. That's um, great. Check out Dave's five hot takes and check out the Dadville podcast and his first stand up live comedy special, which has just been out and go ahead and do a deep dive on all his music. And, um, uh, man, it's been awesome to have you on the air. So thank you so much for having yeah. me. Yeah, thank you on behalf of uh, Gibson Guitars to all our listeners out there. Gibson is doing incredible things. If you're in Dave's Town, Nashville, go stop by the Gibson Garage. It is a, a sight and experience to behold, just to be in the, the room with all these incredible guitars. Whether you play guitar or not, it's just a, such a historic experience, and it's super fun. So go go check out the Gibson Garage in Nashville. And as always, we just want to say thank you and stay human. Peace. Peace.